is a D6 generation pip. Uh, yeah, one of those dots on the side of a six-sided die. Yeah, a pip, you know, a short pip, a little, little something you know, about anything gaming related. Sometimes featuring Craig, sometimes featuring Russ. We'll see what's coming up today. Hey everyone, welcome back to another PIP. Uh, this time around, it's just me again, Craig. It's play season, so uh, uh, crazy month this month, October 2019. I've been running around like crazy for work. Craig, of course, is in the middle of the play season, so he's got very limited access. But I thought I'd try another recording whilst driving again here to get another PIP out. Uh, and again, this time I'm trying a, yet a different microphone configuration, so you almost certainly will hear some car noises in the background as I commute home from work. But um, hopefully this mic's a little closer to my mouth. And when I try to phase out the background noise a little bit in post, hopefully this will be okay. But as always, please let me know. Uh, let me know uh, if this is working out or if I should just stop these. But uh, hopefully they're providing some value and you're getting some entertainment out of it today. I wanted to talk about Star Wars. Um, and sort of an interesting thing here. I had this idea come to me I've recently been getting a lot of Star Wars, um, and I kind of wanted to share with you my thoughts on Star Wars. It was good timing. There's another Star Wars movie coming out um, this holiday season. You know, Disney just opened up Galaxy's Edge, another who's Star Wars theme park. Um, I just went down there to that, um, and I wanted to share some of that journey. But then also, I just bought into Star Wars Legion, the latest starter box, uh, not the original one, which was the Empire, the Imperium, uh, the Imperials, um, Imperium, the Imperials, the Empire versus the Rebels uh, from sort of the original Star Wars movies, the, um, you know, uh, four, five and six. Uh, but now the uh, the battle droids just came out, the battle droids and the Clone Wars set just came out. Um, and so I got that. Um, but I want to tell you about why about that too, and sort of my own Star Wars journey. So I thought it makes the most sense for this all to make sense in any way, shape, or form. I think you have to know a little bit about my relationship with Star Wars. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to share this with you because it will explain why I didn't buy Star Wars Legion until there were battle droids, uh, and it will also explain, I'll give you a little more context for my visit down to Bantu uh, in Galaxy's Edge. So. Uh, you should know that I am old. Uh, Long-time listeners will know that I am uh, not a young person uh, anymore. Um, and so I think when you reach the age of 50, you pretty much can no longer claim you are young or even really middle-aged. I mean, I guess you're middle-aged, but you're still kind of on the back half. They're definitely on the back half of the situation. So um, anyway, um, so Star Wars came out for me um, right when I was like 11, and I saw it in theaters um, and like most folks from my generation, Star Wars had a major impact on me, right? Like it was m my probably all time favorite film, uh, growing up. Uh, and of course I saw Star Wars and of course Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So A New Hope, obviously the first one there, all of those came out, uh, saw them while they came out into the theaters. So I was, you know, surprised by all the turns of events and, and just really enjoyed the whole franchise. And what's interesting about that is Star Wars for me was always part of my nerd, you know, geeky persona. So for so many years, Star Wars was not mainstream. Uh, and it was really just something that really strange weirdo nerds enjoyed just as nerdy and as, you know, sort of, uh, sort of cult classic, although obviously it did very well and the toys were huge and everything else. But it was still one of those movies that was either for kids or really for, um, you know, just really for for nerds. Right. And so D&D was the same way as were board games and role playing games and video games. At that time, all those things were the things I grew up with and to a large part sort of started with my generation. Uh, and and um, and that stuff was just really nerdy for me. And so. It was always sort of self, how we self-identified. And so when you'd wear anything even remotely Star Wars, not everybody would get it, right? Unless you wore the Star Wars logo on your shirt. 
But if you, there was a time where you could wear like an outline drawing of a TIE fighter or a Millennium Falcon on there, and except for other geeks, no one would even look, even know what it was, right? And so for me, that was really cool. Uh, not because I cared if other people liked it too. It was just sort of a way that you could spot other nerds in a crowd because they'd be like, nice shirt, right? Um, and then what happened, um, and, and I really, at that time, I didn't think there was such a thing as too much of a good thing, right? So I was like, man, it would be great if there were more Star Wars movies. It would be great if there was more stuff. Um, and then when the, um, you know, they re-released the Star Wars films in the 90s in theaters with all the, 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 the enhanced versions, right? The special editions with the extra little scenes. And I remember going to those and loving them also because, again, only like nerds and IT guys, like it was kind of a running joke that you could ask questions of, of an interview process with software engineers and IT guys around Star Wars to kind of find out if they're a real engineer or a real nerd because only engineers and nerds really knew all the Star Wars trivia, right? It was just, it was, that was that kind of thing. It was that kind of almost like counterculture sort of thing. And so when Star Wars started to become bigger and become more mainstream, what I started to find was I kind of, like, like when, when the, when the, when the new ver when the prequels came out in the early two thousands, right? So Phantom Menace and the other ones came out. Uh, I loved them also and, and, and went to them and watched them. Uh, and I was one of the few people that actually, that I know that actually didn't hate Phantom Menace. I actually really enjoyed Phantom Menace. I actually thought the battle droids and the whole idea of armies of robots was like super cool. And yeah, the Gungans were a little weird, but my 40 K self was like, man, I love this idea. It was, it was very you know, Star Wars is always fantasy in space to me. And so this idea of the Gungans with shields and catapults fighting robots was so like Warhammer 40,000 and Warhammer fantasy battles in my head that I loved it. That whole battle scene, I was like, man, I really want a miniature game that captures that. This is back in the 2000s. So, you know, at that time, you know, the Daka Daka website was really going strong and the Daka Daka store was just starting out and all that stuff was going on. And so I was super into 40K. And so for me, Phantom Menace had all that in it too. And because it wasn't super popular still, and did, people didn't, and everyone didn't love it, it still felt special to me. So if I'm someone who likes Star Wars and you don't like an, you don't like Phantom Menace, that's okay because it's just this little nerdy thing. And that's cool for me that you don't love it because I'm a nerd and it's okay that I like it and you don't. That's fine. So that was all, so that wasn't, so the prequels didn't bother me that much either. I mean, about this time also, um, stronger videos or games are coming out and the original Knights of the Old Republic came out and I thought that was a much better I really wish that George Lucas had done Nice of the Old Republic with the prequels that should have been made. They're so It's such a good story, such a cool period in the Star Wars uh, universe. I love that. And I've heard a rumor now that they're considering a Knights of the Old Republic sort of movie or TV show or something. Oh my God, that'd be fantastic. I think The Mandalorian's kind of that because it's in that time period. I think. I don't know. I'll have to find out. Anyway, uh, be that as it may, that's all great. Be that as it may. So that was all happening. But then what started happening was Actually, right about the time, not too long after we started the D6 generation in 2008, uh, nerd stuff started to become popular. Sometime around 2010, I don't know, 2011, started to become sort of mainstream. Again, didn't bother me that all this was happening, didn't bother me that was happening, but it was just sort of like, okay. And then when that happened, Star Wars started to become more popular. And I don't remember the exact dates of Disney buying Lucasfilm and all that happening, but that all happened, right? And so that all blew up and that was fine too. But at that point, Star Wars became like super mainstream. And, and I know you're all telling me, the rest of Star Wars has always been big. I know, but it just became like crazy. It was almost when I started realizing there might be such a thing as too much of a good thing. Because it wasn't that I didn't love some of the new Star Wars movies. I mean, they're not my favorites. I actually like the prequels in some ways more than the more recent Star Wars films, honestly. I know that's probably heresy. Um, but I also like the more recent Star Wars films that people don't like more. So, for example, I like Solo and I like Rogue One way more than any of the other new Star Wars Disney movies. Those are my two favorites, even though Solo apparently is, like, supposed to suck. But I love Solo. I thought Solo was fantastic. Anyway, so I still seem to like the things in Star Wars most people don't like as much. But I, whatever that is, I really like that, too. Um, but because it was becoming so mainstream and there had been so many different games about Star Wars, in particular... What really become mainstream was the um, the four, five, and six, right? So the Empire versus the Rebellion, plus now 
the 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 new order versus the resistance, right? So all of that stuff's really gone mainstream because that's the time period Disney's really loving and working over, right? So again, this is all giving you context for what I'm liking and what I don't like it. Meanwhile, the prequels are kind of being ignored, right? They're kind of just over there in the corner, and everybody's like, whatever, George made those. Most people don't like those, so let's just ignore that, which is fine. So that's all happening. And now Star Wars is so big that, you know, you can just see people walking around wearing Star Wars t-shirts. I can buy them in Target. You know, they're everywhere. Star Wars is just a thing. So meanwhile, so that's all happening. And, and so I'm like, okay, well, this is, this is interesting. And I'm still liking the Star Wars movies. And don't get me wrong, I'm going to go to every freaking Star Wars movie they ever make. They, they, they have my money forever. So shut up and take my money when it comes to Star Wars movies. But meanwhile, when Legion came out and it was really focusing, I mean, I've enjoyed playing Legion. We've talked on the show many times that I've enjoyed playing it. But I didn't buy an army in Legion because it's so much, again, of the Star Wars stuff that's already been out. I'm almost like, man, I, it's just not, you know, it's the same old, same old. So then what happened was, Disney opened Galaxy's Edge this past summer. So for those of you who haven't been following this closely, the Galaxy's Edge is a special area of the theme parks. It's a land, essentially, in both Disneyland, California, uh, as well as Walt Disney World, Florida. And it's a whole land. So, you know, not to put too fine of a point on it, but when Universal Studios opened up their Harry Potter area, Diagon Alley, and you can literally, like, walk into, uh, you know, a J.K. Rowling's book, uh, Disney got the message and decided they need to do the same sort of thing. And so they did it with Pandora in Animal Kingdom as sort of like an early test. And by the way, that's an excellent area. And then they decided they're going to do it Star Wars. And this is now what exists in California and in Florida. Uh, I didn't go out to the California one when it opened, but as many of you know, um, we're also, my wife and I are huge Disney nerds and we go down there pretty often with our kids. Uh, we're in the vacation club. I think I've talked about this on the show before. So it, it's easy for us to get down there. We always have an annual pass because it's cheaper than a week in the parks if you're a vacation club member. And then the other thing is because my wife flies so much for work, she gets all these sky miles that allow us to bounce around once in a while. So yeah, we we're in a position where we can kind of jump down there for a weekend and we're like, you know what, why don't we bounce down there for, um, a Columbus Day weekend. The kids are old enough. My kids are both teenagers now. They can stay by themselves. We'll bounce down there. Nicole and I usually do once a quarter, once every three months, we find try to find a weekend to do a little just us getaway. And it's usually someplace romantic, like a little inn or a bed and breakfast or something. We're like, well, let's go to Florida, go to go check out Star Wars. Now, I was super excited to see it, but honestly, this is how this is how weird I've become with Star Wars. But honestly, I was more excited to ride in the new Skyliner. So Disney World has opened up this new transportation system that connects uh, two of the parks, Epcot and Hollywood Studios, and it also connects several of the resorts by basically gondola, by like, you know, a little uh, gondola Skyliner system. And it's cool because it's different and it's kind of like the monorail, be very unique. It's all electric, it's green energy. But it's also cool because you're flying around in a gondola going from places forth. And it never stops. So you can hop right on it. And within minutes, you've gone from Epcot to Hollywood Studios. Or you've gone from Hollywood Studios over to uh, one of the resorts. Much cooler than riding around the buses. Anyway, I wanted to see this. And it just opened up also. And I wanted to see that more. I actually found myself thinking, man, I can't wait to ride the, can't wait to ride the gondolas even more than I couldn't wait to fly the Millennium Falcon. Which is weird. I know, right? It's weird. Because Star Wars is so overdone now that to me... In my head, right in my head, the, the 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 Skyliner thing was more unique than seeing Star Wars up close, which I know is weird. I know it's really weird, and I even felt, and I could consciously, my conscious mind was like, "This is weird. You're a, you're a geek. You're a nerd. You grew up on Star Wars. You should be more excited than anything than seeing the Star Wars land." So anyway, so uh, we go out to Disney World, we get down there, uh, and what we find out is. And one of the reasons we wanted to go down there was we knew that they were doing the special thing where if you're a hotel guest, uh, only for the fall, this fall, that's it, they're opening the uh, Hollywood Studios up where, where Galaxy's Edge is located two hours early in the morning only for hotel guests. So if you're staying in a Disney hotel, you can go over at 6, at 5.30 in the morning and walk into Hollywood Studios and go into Galaxy's Edge um, at 6 a.m. and stay there till 9 a.m. and the main park doesn't open until 9 a.m. So basically a very small percentage of the park's capacity 
will be will be in use for these three hour window for hotel guests. So what a cool way to see Star Wars before everybody else could. And what a cool way to get on the ride and have only to wait for like a half an hour, 40 minutes or an hour, as opposed to everybody and their cousin wanting to go on and wait for four hours or whatever it is. So we're like, that seems the right thing to do. So we go over there and, and we're waiting to get in and then we do, we're there at rope drop, rope drop. Um, and we're in the main part of the park and they drop the rope and everybody starts walking towards the back of the park where Galaxy's Edge is and they start playing, they, they just announce it's opening up and they start playing a variant of the Imperial March. It's actually the new March from the Resistance, uh, but it's the same sort of, you can, there's no doubt in your mind it's Star Wars music, it's Imperial music, and it's just playing. Dun, 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 you're walking in and you're just in this massive crowd of people and it's a crowd of people. They're all wearing Star Wars shirts. Now I'm wearing, again, I know, weird. Uh, and I'm not trying. I'm not trying to say I'm super special. Thing. I'm just weird about this. So I'm wearing one of my T-shirts that I got from Armor Class 10, AC10, which is a, a really cool nerdy T-shirt company. And everybody else is wearing like the, t- the Star Wars T-shirts you can buy at Target and everything. But I got the one <laughs> because again, I'm trying to be a little more subtle, right? So I got this shirt that just says "How to Fly Casual," and it shows different ships and different paths for how to fly casual versus non-casual. Now again, you're only gonna get that if you can remember this one line from, you know, Return of the Jedi, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So it's not like, my shirt doesn't say Star Wars on it or not a Millennium Falcon, but, but, so I'm just like, you know, I'm Star Warsy, but I'm, you know, a little more subtle Star Warsy, and we're going in there, but I'm just suddenly, I'm like one with the crowd, the music's playing, and I can feel my inner 10-year-old Russ is like, okay, this is kind of awesome. And we got into the land and of course you take this corner and all of a sudden you are on a different planet. And it's the, the theming is called Bantu, uh, which is this planet that's never been seen in the movies. It's been referenced a couple times in some books and Disney chose this because this way it's a unique location that gives the Imagineers a little more latitude because they don't have to build it exactly like, you know, something else in the Star Wars universe, they have a little bit of room. Um, but they have an overall fluff thing happening here where there's this one sort of smuggler guy who runs the whole joint. Uh, Bantu has a look and feel of kind of like Tatooine, so it's that those browns, a little bit deserty, um, and it's you know it's, it takes place during the current part of the saga. So the Millennium Falcon is parked there, and I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but basically it's on loan from Chewbacca because uh, this the smugglers. It needs repairs, and the smuggler is willing to give the repairs for free if they can have the Falcon to run some missions with, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, smuggler needs some people to fly the Falcon for him. You're it, right? There you go. Uh, but but what's cool is you're walk, walking in there, and the music's playing, and you're marching, and you're going into, into, into Bantu here, and up on these ridges, and you can't see any part of our world, right? The way they've got it built out is there's just mountains and peaks, and you're seeing on one side, there's a there's a... There's a resistance kind of TIE fighter thing. There's no doubt in your mind it's a TIE fighter, but it's the newer variant. On the left-hand side, there's a life-size X-Wing parked, and there's people in costumes repairing it, and 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 mist and gases are, are pumping out of it as it's ready for takeoff. And, like, you're just... My my mind was like... And, you know, I can still see all the guests, and I know we're in a theme park, but my mind is literally going click, click, click. I'm become, I'm, it's, it's like the closest thing I can say to it is if you're ever at a really good Ren fair and you're able to actually suspend your disbelief for a moment and sort of feel like, this is kind of cool, I'm kind of like my D&D character for a minute, you know, for like 30 seconds. Like, that happened to me, I had that moment. And as I'm walking around, the other thing they did really amazingly well, and, and I first saw this sort of thing again at Universal Studios, actually, to be fair, Universal got this right to begin with. When you go into Diagon Alley Universal, you go in and there are, there, is, there are shops where you can buy the wands, right? Like Ollivander's in the book, but if you remember in the movies, when you go into these shops, they're all higgledy piggledy and they're a mess and they're a disaster. And somehow Universal made it look like that with actual products in a mess and a disaster, but you can buy it there. So it's a functioning store that literally looks exactly like the ones in the movie. So it's not like you go to a gift shop and it's like a modern retail experience. It's actually like you're in a Harry Potter store. They've done this in Bantu with Star Wars, Disney has. So you're walking down a street and there's like all these little barterers and marketing guys trying to sell you their wares. And they're in costume, but they're cast members. And instead of selling you a live animal, they're selling you a stuffed animal. But 
there's live animatronic animals moving in the tanks of water and the whole thing's just happening and you're like, oh my God. And all of a sudden, one of them will jump at the edge of the tank and make you jump. And it's just the way they pulled it off. And it may have been the fact the sun was rising and the place wasn't crowded, but it just felt real. And so Nicole and I went into one of the little cantinas there and it looks like a cargo bay. And so to a point when you, from the outside, you can see a ship docked on the roof. And from the inside, you can tell that the docking bay, the bottom of the docking bay has opened and these grapples have come down from the ship and they're in the middle of pulling up a crate. And meanwhile, there's counter service there with cast members all in costume and all the, even the credit card machines are all themed after Star Wars. Everything's got the Star Wars language all over it. And there's an app for your phone that you can point at it. I'll translate it all for you. Um, you order your food, it comes in cool looking trays like they're right out of Star Wars. The way they've done the food is shaped in such a way that it's just like Star Wars, like it's just this really cool looking, and you know, Star Wars is very grungy, so it looks all grungy, but but it's tasty. And we got our food and Nicole had to run to the bathroom, so I'm sitting there and it was early enough where no one was else was there. So I sit it down on a cargo crate, a table that's actually a cargo crate. I'm at the cargo crate, I got my like sort of metal tray in front of me, like I'm in Star Wars, and I look up and the doors to the restaurant slide open and slide close, just like they do in Star Wars, like you know. And the door slides open, and standing out front are two stormtroopers. And they just look at me, and they just point, and we'll go, we know you're up to something. Keep it clean, pal. And the door closes, and he walks away. And at that moment, because I couldn't see anybody else, and my wife wasn't there, I just had to, it was just like, oh my God, I'm sitting, I'm, I'm in Tatooine right now. I'm like, I'm in a Star Wars movie. And 10-year-old Russ just like flipped out. And I realized, it was in that moment that I realized everything's worked out perfectly. Like, the part of the Star Wars fan in me that was like, you know what, I kind of wish it was not quite so crazy because I feel like part of, part of myself has been sort of extrapolated for the masses. But then I realized like, yeah, except this wouldn't exist if the rest of the world couldn't see how awesome Star Wars is. And because the rest of the world has now seen how awesome Star Wars is, Disney was able to make this awesome experience for everyone, including, and and not everyone's gonna get that level of experience, right? Not everyone's gonna get every single detail that's there. Most people are probably just gonna walk in, ride the Millennium Falcon ride, ride the other Resistance ride when it's out, maybe have a hot dog and leave. But the hardcore Star Wars fans can appreciate and see the little stuff. And all the cast members are in character the entire time. Every single retail person. We went to Oga's Cantina, which was basically a variant of the Moss Eisley Cantina. And man, it was awesome. I got a drink there, the Fuzzy Tauntaun. The way it's set up is, I don't know what they put on top of it, but it literally numbed your mouth like Novocaine. It was crazy, it was awesome. Um, that whole experience was crazy too. Like the whole thing, they nailed it. I it, and, and as I left, I was like, they did it. And this is amazing. And that was when I decided, like I got totally back into Star Wars mode, mode and was totally okay with everything that was happening. And that's when I realized, and so this is how it dovetails into why I bought into Star Wars Legion. So literally, uh, you know, I'm, I'm walking out of there and I'm heading back to the hotel for the day and we're going to take an afternoon rest. The way I wipe my wife and I do Disney is we go out early in the morning, we hit the parks hard, we have a lot of fun. And then we try to come back to the hotel and just crash in the afternoon, relax a little bit, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy some downtime, enjoy the hotel itself. And then the evening we'll go back out, have a nice dinner, maybe do some fireworks or something. So we're going back to rest. And, you know, you, like you do, you check in the phone and uh, sure enough, um, you know, my, my favorite, lo my, my local gaming store is putting up, taking pre-orders now. Star Wars Legion's coming out in two weeks. I'm like, oh my God, it's coming out right when I get back. This is going to, and then I was like, oh my God, it's the battle droids. And that's when I had the flashback to how much 40K rust from the 2000s was like, man, wouldn't it be awesome if I could redo the Gungans versus the battle droids? And there are the battle droids right there in a box. And I'm like man, I'm getting this. Why not? Like, I'm back into Star Wars. Star Wars is back for me. Thanks, Disney. Like, I don't know what happened. Uh, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be parts of me that's going to be not loving whatever the next, next, next movie is. Um, but I don't care because it doesn't matter because what they've done is so fantastic down there. Um, and what Fantasy Flight has done, and again, if Star Wars wasn't this big and this massive, Fantasy Flight couldn't do this either. So I am now super excited about Star Wars Legion. And so I immediately, while I was still in the parks, I'm like texting my store owner, please order me a box. I'm going to pick it up as soon as I get back. So got back, picked up my box and 
dove right into it. Now, one thing you guys should know, if you're considering getting into Star Wars Legion, um, the, the new one, the Clone Wars episode or box, I should warn you, all the Star Wars Legion stuff to date is, com- is, is, is unpainted plastics, excuse me, some assembly required, but they're in the little baggies and there's no sprues to worry about or clipping or filing. You just basically dump the baggies out, organize the bits, glue them together, uh, and you're ready to go. So assembling things like the Clone Warriors and the Stormtroopers and Darth Vader and Luke and the Heroes of the Rebellion and the Rebel Soldiers, that's all really easy. But now what's happened is um, the Battle Droids, though, when you buy the new box, uh, the Clone Troopers are like the other Legion stuff. They go together super easy. But the Battle Droids, they wanted to get right. And they wanted them to be super thin and super fine because, quite frankly, the Battle Droids are very, you know, if you look at them, they're not much to them. So, and the Droid Dakar is the same, the same way, right? The, the, the round ones that have the little force fields, those guys are also super fine. So they come on sprues. And it's like, I'm not exaggerating. It's like, I want to say it's like eight to 15 pieces per battle droid. Like uh, arms and legs are four, right? Because there's two arms, two legs you got to glue on. There is a backpack, that's five. There's a torso, that's six. There's the head, that's seven. So I guess it's seven or eight. And then some of them have extra little bits, like the commander's got some, got a little binoculars. So it's a, it takes you a lot to put these guys together. The cool part is they're reasonably posable, particularly the heads. And the other cool part is because they're true plastic on a sprue and not that semi-resin stuff that comes in the baggie, you can use polystyrene cement. And I would highly recommend polystyrene cement so you can pose them just so. So that's the first warning. I love how they look, by the way. They look fantastic, but they are, it's like assembling. Uh, someone asked me on, on Twitter when I was putting pictures up and I did check the D6G Twitter feed. You'll see some of the pictures of the assembly, so you can see how, how how challenging it is before you buy. And then also, I painted a few up, more about that in a second, and you can see my, my initial paint jobs. But uh, someone was asking me, are they Malifaux fiddly, the Malifaux New Plastics fiddly? Uh, not quite as bad as Malifaux, but they are, um, they're in the ballpark of maybe um, some of the older GW stuff. Um, so a lot going on there, but I like them. I mean, I enjoyed it. It took a while. Once I got the polystyrene back, I just haven't done that level of assembly in a long time. Um, but I really enjoyed putting them together. And I have to say, I really love these guys with the contrast paint. So, you know, the battle droids have a lot of subtle features. Like their eyes are sort of, if, if you remember your battle droids, and you probably don't, because they're, you know, they're not shown very often in the Star Wars. You know, they're obviously in the first movie, but they, haven't, they don't make an appearance over and over again like stormtroopers. But when you look at them carefully, you'll notice that their heads, even their eyes, are just sort of like etched into their face plates. They're not really like distinct, like C-3PO's eyes. Um, so everything is just like a subtle, very thinly carved, etched out layer on their bodies. Perfect for contrast paints. So I was like, you know what? I wonder if this will work. So I spray painted them with, and one of the things our friendly local gaming store has discovered, and I think this is very an accurate tip of the contrast paints, The base coat preparation is critical for contrast paints. Because contrast paints flow so smoothly, if you don't get a good base coat on there and use a primer that like powders up or cracks in any way, the contrast paints are gonna flow in a weird way and highlight it in a way you don't want. So when you're using contrast paints, the good news is they save you tons of time. The bad news is you really need to spring for the good primers. And so um, I, I sprung for the GW uh, Skull White, I think it's called, I can't remember what it's called, but the, the GW Citadel Primer, uh, the white one. And I like priming in white for contrast paints. Um, you can get it with different colors, but I like the white. So I, I primed the Battle Droids all white with GW Primer. And then I actually, the, the biggest paint I used with them was the um, Skeleton Horde. It's a very light brown. And by doing that on them, it worked perfectly. It dove right in and filled in their eyes and highlighted all their lines, but it made them, it turned that white into a very light beige in one easy coat. And they look like they're, I mean, I feel like they look like they're right out of the movie, but you tell me, look in the D6G Twitter feed or the D6G Facebook group and you'll see them. Um, So I really, I really did just three colors on them and I didn't do multiple coats. So I primed them white and then everywhere that wasn't their gun, 
pretty much. Um, I hit with the Skeleton Horde Brown. And then for their guns, I just hit them with the Chaos Black contrast paint. One coat on that, and it flowed in the right way, and so their guns are black. And for most of the battle droids, that's it. For the leaders, um, you notice, you remember in the movie, some of them had like yellow paint on their helmets. And so for the leader, I put, um, there's a, I think it's Ayendan yellow contrast paint. And for the leader, I just made very carefully, I avoided certain parts of their head when I put the brown on, and then I just put the yellow right on that spot. And I really like how it came out. He, in my mind, he's right out of the movie. It looks great. Um, super easy to do. I did a unit of eight this way, and then I had to go off to another work trip. But I can't wait, because I'm going this weekend, I'm going to try to crank the rest of them out. Because it's really, the hardest part is assembling them, honestly. Painting them, I can do seven of them. I did seven of them in 30 minutes, and I'm not exaggerating. Very, very straightforward. Loving the models. Also, I, I think I like the rules for them, too. I haven't played yet with them, but I played enough Star Wars Legions to know the rules pretty well. The uh, the droid Dakar, which I haven't assembled yet, droid Dekas, I should say, there's no R in their name. Uh, they, have, um, they have two ways you can model them. You can model them standing up with their little four little legs out and their guns extended, or you can model them in mid-roll. And what's super cool is during the game, you can trans, there's rules for them to transform for their modes, and if you put them in the rolling mode, they are much faster, like literally three times as fast, which is awesome, on the battlefield, uh, but their shields aren't on when that mode, but they have, they're a little harder to hit. So they dodge better, but if you hit them, you'll do more damage. When they're stationary and they pop up, they're much slower, but now they can shoot, and they got that little shield bubble up, which is the shield rules are awesome, are really tough to beat in Star Wars Legion. But they slowly get beaten down, the shields does, and then they get penetrated. So it's really a cool, cool fluff. Battle droids, similarly, they're the cheap, cheap troop of volume in the, in the Star Wars Legion universe now, you can tell. And actually, they have an AI rule where um, they have to shoot first. <laughs> so they're very much like, I don't know, they're really interesting, too. They look like they're just cheap shock troops. But with the right equipment, you can make them very effective. And with the right leaders, you can make them very effective. So it's really interesting. I think it's, it's going to be a lot of fun to play with them. So I can't wait to get those guys on the table. I'm going to try to, this weekend, finish painting them up and getting them going. And I'm so uh, very much back into my Star Wars mode. So I don't know. There you go. A little touchy-feely episode for you there. But I wanted to share with you some of the things I've been thinking about Star Wars lately. And I hadn't really thought even like just sharing my feelings about how it was bothering me that Star Wars was so mainstream. It was weird because you've asked me like six months ago if it bothered me. I would have said no, but I don't think I really realized it was until I had that moment in Galaxy's Edge. Um, and and now I can't wait to go back. So we did that little scouting mission, but my family uh, and, uh, and my brother's family are all going down uh, for April vacation this year. Super excited about that. Uh, if you're going down too, let me know. Maybe I'll say hi. So uh, uh, thanks again for listening. Um, again, let me know, please, if you um, how this car recording is. I'm tr- I, I'm, it's great that I can find the time to record in the car, but I um, want to make sure that the show quality is listenable. So I've tried three different audio methodologies. The very first one I did was sort of uh, on my phone, which everybody told me was terrible. So the next one I did was with uh, Apple AirPods you know, in my ear. And people told me that was a little better. Um, This one is with a lavalier mic uh, plugged into my laptop safely in the rear of the car while I'm driving. So let me know how this sounds. Hopefully this is palatable. I know there's no way not to have the background audio in it, but hopefully it's, it's muffled and quiet. So thanks again, everyone. And we'll talk to you again soon. Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, You can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. Thanks for listening and happy gaming.